My name is Carrie van der Weyden. I'm a haematologist. Um, I'm also a researcher and I work at the clinical haematology unit that sits in um, Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and the Royal Melbourne Hospital. I have a particular interest in T-cell lymphoma and that includes peripheral T-cell lymphoma, which is one of the nodal types of, of T-cell lymphomas. So this is a particularly rare group of lymphomas um, and like um, other types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it isn't actually one diagnosis. So peripheral T-cell lymphoma comprises a group or a number of different types of lymphoma, all of which have different labels that sit under that one banner heading. And all of those subgroups of lymphomas have slightly different ways in which they present and slightly different prognoses, as well as um, may have different ways in which they behave in response to treatment. So the sorts of patients whom I see um, with these diagnoses um, have different labels and some of the most common ones that fit under that heading of peripheral T-cell lymphoma include peripheral T-cell lymphoma NOS or PTCL not otherwise specified. Um, the other most common ones that we see in the Australian setting are angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma or AITL for short. We also see patients who have things like anaplastic large cell lymphoma and that can be two groups depending on whether that has an expression of a particular protein on its surface called ALK. So we have some patients who have what's called ALK positive anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which is slightly less common than the other subtype, ALK negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma. The tricky thing about peripheral T cell lymphoma is that there are a whole lot of other much more rare diagnoses or diagnostic labels that also get put into that group. But for the most part, the most common conditions that I see fall into those um, three groups that we just outlined. Um, in terms of the way that this presents, it can be infinitely variable, but most people present because they notice an enlarged lymph gland or they have symptoms from enlarged lymph glands that can be anywhere in the body. So sometimes it's as simple as noticing enlarged lymph glands somewhere where the patient can feel them, such as in the neck, under the arm, in the groin, or sometimes they're deeper in the chest or in the stomach, um, tucked around all the organs that are in the abdomen and sometimes people can get symptoms as a result of the enlargement of those lymph glands. Other times people present with what are called B symptoms, so things like weight loss, very high fevers, um, unexplained changes in temperature, um, and what's called night sweat, so profuse sweating to the point that people are soaking through their pyjamas at night time. Some of these conditions present in much more subtle ways and particularly angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma can present with changes in the immune system. So I have some patients who had um, changes in their skin, rashes, um, vulnerability to infection and it was that that led to the diagnostic process that culminated in their diagnosis of angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma. Uh, it is actually relatively common for people to have a long diagnostic process. So sometimes people can have symptoms that last for many months and they have many groups of doctors trying to work out exactly what is happening with them before they come to the final conclusion of this being a T-cell lymphoma. And it's certainly something that I encounter in my practice with some of my patients. Um, and understandably that can be quite frustrating for some people, um, but also a little bit scary. Um, and sometimes people will actually say the most uh, relieving thing is having a diagnostic label to put on this group of symptoms that they've been experiencing for some time. Um, in general terms, when people have a diagnosis made, uh, usually on a biopsy, um, that will allow us to give a diagnostic label, work out which one of those subgroups we think uh, is the most appropriate name by which to call this lymphoma and then people will go through a process of staging and that's to work out how um, many bodily systems are involved, how uh, widespread is the extent of the lymphoma at diagnosis. So looking at if there are groups of lymph, node in, lymph nodes involved, are they above and below the diaphragm, are there involvement of other body organs, is there involvement of things like the spleen or the bone marrow and that helps us put together the stage of the lymphoma. Once we have all of that information, uh, then the next step is obviously to talk about treatment options. And this is where it can get very tricky 
So a lot of the time the things that we talk about are what is the type of lymphoma and there are some subtle decisions that we make in terms of putting together a program of treatment that depend on how we expect that lymphoma is likely to behave. So some of those lymphomas have a slightly better prognosis and need less of aggressive treatment in the first line. And some of them we know tend to behave more bad in a more aggressive fashion or behave badly is how I like to think of it. And so we tend to think about putting together um, a more intensive package of treatment for that group of patients. The other really important component that goes into thinking about treatment is who's the person that I'm looking after? So how old is the patient? Um, what's their fitness like? What are their other health conditions? Do I think that giving them really intensive therapy would be something that they would be able to tolerate without significant side effects? So lots of discussion around what is the best way to control the lymphoma, but also what's the best package of treatment that will control the lymphoma without putting my patient at risk. In very general terms, we tend to think about these um, lymphomas all requiring treatment with chemotherapy. And by that, we tend to mean cytotoxic treatment. Um, this is actually a really exciting field to work in because that approach is changing a little bit as a result of some clinical trials that have come out recently. And so what we're looking at is whether there are ways in which we can get better results for our patients who are having first-line treatment. And by that we mean the first treatment that they're exposed to after they've had their diagnosis established. In general terms, for younger patients and patients who we think are fit and healthy, we tend to prioritise chemotherapy. And there are a mixture of different recipes that we pick or what we call chemotherapy regimens. And we very often will talk about adding in some treatment in first line called an autologous stem cell transplant. And that's a big mouthful, but essentially what that means is using the patient's own blood cells, so cells that have the capacity to grow up into different types of blood cells that we see in the bloodstream, to um, be able to give them a large dose of chemotherapy um, to then have their bone marrow recover from that in a very short time frame, that means it's actually safe to deliver that big whack of chemo, for want of a better term. We think that the combination of both induction chemotherapy or first line chemotherapy, plus a stem cell transplant in patients who are fit and whose lymphoma seems to be responding to that treatment, gives a longer duration of response, so a longer period of time in which we would expect that the lymphoma would remain under control. For patients who aren't fit for that type of treatment, we often will still talk about chemotherapy, but we think that the risk of going through a transplant is actually too great to suggest that that would be the most appropriate um, regimen to undertake. It's actually um, where the nuance comes in is in selection of the drugs that make up that chemotherapy recipe for the patient and also looking at whether there are other newer treatments that we can add to standard chemotherapy back backbones that have been in use for many years in the clinic. So there are some newer treatments that aim not to just indiscriminately kill rapidly dividing cells, which is essentially essentially what cancer cells are, but to pick on weaknesses that are specific to the lymphoma. So to look at maybe markers or proteins that the lymphoma has on their surface that might mean that they're vulnerable to treatments that target that. So for example, um, in patients who have um, alkanegative anaplastic large cell lymphoma, there's a recent clinical trial which has shown that adding a particular medication called brentuximab for dotin to standard chemotherapy gives people better control of their lymphoma and for longer compared to standard chemotherapy backbones. And so the conversation around the best treatment to pick is quite a nuanced one, but I guess the thing to understand is that there are very careful um, considerations that are brought into play when we put together a package of treatment for any one patient. The tricky thing about T-cell lymphomas is that in comparison to other types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that we see more commonly in the clinic, particularly B-cell lymphomas, um, they have a tendency to misbehave. And by that I mean that they 
sometimes don't respond to standard treatment in first line or patients will see that their lymphoma goes into remission so we get good control of the lymphoma and then it comes back sooner than we would expect when we look at other groups of patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma or other types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it's very common for, pa uh, for patients with this group of lymphoma to have uh, a cancer that is what we call refractory, in that it doesn't respond to first-line treatment, or it relapses earlier than we would expect. And this is actually a really tricky um, group of patients to look after in that when we look at what's um, done in the literature uh, and in what best practice is globally, there is no one standard of care that comes out and says this is the best treatment for this patient whose lymphoma is not responding in the way that we would expect. There is research underway and certainly there are lots of clinical trials that try to work out that option but at the moment um, approaches to treatment are very individually based and by that we look at what are the treatments that we can access for this person? This person? What are the treatments that um, we think this person will tolerate? And what are the clinical trial options available to this person? In general terms, um, for patients with relapse or refractory T-cell lymphoma, we do sometimes talk about more chemotherapy if they've had chemotherapy in first line. Um, but sometimes we move much more towards treatments that aim to target either the machinery that are, is helping keep the lymphoma alive, so what we call things that target the genetic profile or the molecular profile of the lymphoma, or otherwise things that aim to target weaknesses of the lymphoma, um, such as markers that they have on their surface or proteins that they have on their surface. And sometimes we use those in novel combinations. Um, so it's a very exciting place in which to work but also a very difficult place in which to work um, and uh, often the discussion about the best treatment for patients who have relapsed or refractory lymphoma has to be one that's had with a, one person rather than saying everybody gets treatment A or everybody gets treatment B.